Hallo und herzlich willkommen zur Ringvorlesung Informationswissenschaft und Digital Humanities hier an der Heinrich-Heine-Universität Düsseldorf. Wir begrüßen Sie auch wieder heute ganz herzlich und heute dann zu unserem Vortrag von Frau Professor Regina Schober mit dem Titel Das Algorithmische Selbst, mediale Konfiguration und narrative Perspektiven. Und Frau Schober ist hier seit 2020 Professorin für die Amerikanistik an der Heinrich-Reine-Universität in Düsseldorf, hat aber auch ähm, schon an anderen Universitäten als Gastwissenschaftlerin gearbeitet, die University of California, die Harvard University oder auch die University of Virginia. Und vom Forschungsinteresse ähm, bewegt sie sich in den Bereichen zu Netzwerkkonzepten, der Transformation, der Subjektivität im Informationszeitalter, das quantifizierte Selbst oder aber auch Theorien des Lesens und Diskurs des Scheiterns. Und was vielleicht auch noch ganz interessant ist hier an der HHU, ist sie auch beteiligt am universitätsweiten Projekt AI for All, also I for All. Und ähm, genau. Damit ähm, sind wir auch wieder schon ein bisschen bei der Überleitung zu unserem Vortrag heute mit Frau Professor Regina Schober. Und an diesem Punkt bleibt mir eigentlich nur zu sagen, dass wir auch direkt zu Ihnen jetzt wechseln, ähm, Frau Professor Schober, und dass Sie sehr gerne schon mal Ihre Folien teilen können. Genau, da ploppt schon etwas auf. Und wunderbar, wir können die Folien jetzt auch sehr gut sehen. Und damit übergebe ich nun sehr gerne das Wort an Sie, Frau Professor Schober, und wir freuen uns schon sehr auf Ihren Vortrag heute. Ja, vielen Dank, Frau Dorsch, vielen Dank für die Einladung. Ich freue mich sehr, hier zu sein. I'm going to switch to English now. Um, because um, most of my material is in English and I think this will make things easier. So the English title of my talk um, is The Algorithmic Self, Media Configurations and Narrative Perspectives. Um, today I want to talk about a specific conception of selfhood, which I will call the algorithmic self. So. I would like to address two questions. What do we mean when we talk about the algorithmic self as a cultural concept um, and as a media configuration? And also, um, how does contemporary literature, especially American literature, depict and negotiate the algorithmic self? So negotiate means how does it um, talk about the, we could say the benefits and the limitations of, and how does it try to, get a, a grip um, of this concept. I find these questions interesting because first of all, I believe that our experiences, our value systems, our affective relations in the world and to the world are to a large extent shaped by the media affordances of algorithms, right? So what algorithmic structures enable us to do. And these, um, these algorithmic affordances, we could say, have produced, I think, a new form of subjectivity, which I would call the algorithmic self. I'm not the only one, so I'll, I'll tell you where this term um, it comes from, actually. Um, and second, I think this algorithmic self is increasingly described and also critically assessed in literature, in fiction. Um, it's quite interesting, um, if we think about narrative fiction, what you can see here on the left-hand side is Robinson Crusoe, um, often called one of the first literary expressions of the self-reflexive and self-reliant individuals. So we could say that this is a model for a sense of self-awareness through written introspection, right? So the novel with its focus on employment and its inbuilt structure, of quest and problem solving, its display of navigation through space and time, and its capacity to explore the psychological constitution of the individual has had a particular affinity to self-formation ever since the 18th century. 
And this is a process of gaining self-awareness through the practice of writing. So we call this uh, sometimes life writing, right? The um, writing of the self or writing of life. Now, what happens when new media configurations become primary modes of self-formation? For example, algorithms or algorithmic infrastructures. How does the tradition and the practice of self-writing or life writing change? Um, as you can see, my approach to the digital humanities is a little bit different from those that you have um, heard in the past weeks, perhaps. So I would um, describe my approach to the digital humanities as a, a critical digital humanities approach or a critical approach to the digital humanities, sometimes also called humanities of the digital. Camille um, or Roth has, has uh, coined that term, and I find this quite interesting to understand how this is a little bit different from, let's say, computational uh, uh, digital humanities. So as you can see here, some of my previous uh, projects, I have uh, written a habilitation thesis on network uh, concepts in US American culture. So a cultural, um, um, a cultural perspective on networks and the network as a, a figure of thought or as a concept or a metaphor, we could say. Um, also, I have um, co-edited a, a, a special issue of the journal American Naturalism. Um, you can't really see that on the slide, I'm sorry, um, on data fiction, right? So on the, on the connection between data on the one hand and fiction or narrative on the other hand. Also, I have been part of several uh, research projects funded by the DFG. One, for example, probing the limits of the quantified self. Um, so again, literary and cultural conceptions of self-quantification or self-tracking. Um, self um, also within the research network, the failure of knowledge, knowledge is a failure. I'm particularly interested in the metaphor of toxicity in relation uh, to digital culture. So I'm kind of looking at the digital pharmacon um, uh, concept. And in a uh, research network on, uh, on the relationship between the economy and literature called model aesthetics, I am particularly interested in the attention economy, right? So um, digital reading experiences. And I'm uh, at the moment increasingly interested in the specific act of and narratives of algorithmic self-formation, which I would actually see in a continuation of my previous projects. I explicitly use the word formation to emphasize the fact that the self is never essentially given, right? So there is no, sen uh, no such thing as the self or, you know, myself or my identity, if you will. Um, but the self is always dependent on processes of forming, modeling, making. And the term also suggests a post-humanist rethinking of the self as um, it challenges the um, assumption of the liberal autonomous self who is in full control of um, this process of self-making. Rather, I regard the self as always bound to the specific form or to use Carolyn Levine's new formalist approach, the specific affordances and politics of this form. Cultural narratives of artificial intelligence have long centered on robots who gain superhuman powers, right? Um, and these conceptions usually create a sense of unease or even fear in our relationship with digital technology. We consider artificial intelligence a higher form of intelligence sometimes, right? Perhaps most prominently conceptualized in the theory of the singularity with its resulting super intelligence. This anthropomorphization of algorithms or rather deification um, creates cultural narratives that suggest that human agency is somehow at risk, um, that we have to fear artificial intelligence, we have to fear algorithms, perhaps most prominently in the robot or in the destructive robot narrative. Ed Finn um, has shown in his book, What Do Algorithms Want? That cultural narratives 
about algorithms as black boxes are very pervasive, right? That we usually think we don't understand algorithms, so they're black boxes. And because we don't understand them, they're scary and, and we, we can't do anything about them, right? That our agency is limited here. Um, but also, not only that we're scared about them, that also that they're somehow mysterious, perhaps um, uh, that they're somehow even spiritual, right? So this mystical exaltation is also part of our cultural relationship with algorithms. Today, I want to discuss two novels that follow a slightly different approach to algorithms. Patricia Lockwood's novel, No One Is Talking About This, and Natasha Stagg's novel, Surveys. These two novels are by no means um, uh, Terminator-like AI narratives. The algorithms here remain abstract infrastructures um, rather than being embodied by humanoid machines, right? So both novels negotiate the potentials of self-formation in algorithmic structures of social media. Both, I would say, explore the affordances of algorithmic self-formation while also denaturalizing and demystifying algorithms in the sense of de-blackboxing. Um, so in a way, both novels show us how we as humans can still enter the picture, how we can intervene uh, and take responsibility for our um, uh, use of, um, and perhaps of, uh, also regulation of algorithms. Now, what are algorithms? I probably don't have to tell you, um, but and I'm not really that uh, qualified to tell you in much detail, but I will try and summarize perhaps a few points. Algorithms are sequences of um, formalized rules, right, that are followed in calculations. For example, when a computer is trying to solve a problem. And of course, the classic recipe, uh, the classic example here would be a cooking recipe. But when combined with a huge data set, an algorithm can perform automated decision making processes. And strictly speaking, then an algorithm can only perform within the set of rules and the data sets that humans have created. So the question really is who should be afraid of whom, right? Should we really be afraid of the algorithms or of the humans who have created them? Um, algorithms are trained on uh, billions of narratives um, and uh, thereby reproduce or perhaps reveal nothing but the smallest common denominator of our collective selfhood, we could say. Or as Kate Crawford has said, AI is neither artificial nor intelligent. And since the training data and the algorithms are cultural products, they just as much reproduce cultural biases and blind spots. They reproduce structures of discrimination and equalities and are by no means neutral. We have all heard of facial recognition programs, for example, that fail to recognize black faces or the hyper surveillance of marginalized communities due to skewed data sets. So the politics of recognition here also play a huge role. Felix Stalder considers algorithms an ordering principle for the overwhelming masses of data in that they sort format data in order to be made meaningful by individuals and communities. This is a function we may add that storytelling, of course, has had for a long time, right? And still does. Um, Felix Steider adds that in order for algorithms to become operational instructions, they have to be determined in three ways. First, they have to follow a formalized language, usually a programming language that ideally eliminates polysemy and ambiguity. Second, they have to be practically realizable. And third, they have to be me mechanically executable. And this has also to a large extent been entwined with the efficiency paradigm in capitalism. Um, that is the mechanical automation of production, which then again enabled advanced operability of algorithms in machines. Today, algorithms constitute the largely invisible infrastructures of our everyday experience. 
um, we know this, right? Through search engine results, personalized consumer recommendation systems to uh, micro-targeting in political advertising or Wikipedia entries created by bots. What also increasingly turns algorithms into black boxes is that they are dynamic and adaptive, which means that they increasingly write and modify themselves in processes of self-monitoring and self-evaluation. Stalder therefore calls algorithms forms of world creation. In, um, so what he means is that they produce highly personalized and situational models of the world constantly, right? In order for an algorithm to be able to do this, it also has to turn the individual into a set of data. So we all become data sets, right? Individuals turn into data profiles with predefined variables that can be targeted, extracted, and in turn modeled into types that display predictable behavior, most obviously consumption behavior or consumer behavior. Algorithms can measure and track human behavior through empirical data. Although the positivistic reduction of the self into a data profile will probably never be able to model the complexities of the psychological dimensions of human experience, I would argue. And I know uh, others may perhaps argue differently. However, algorithmic self-formation as it engages in constant processes of feedback with the system can quickly adapt to emerging social realities. John Cheney Lippold has called this a new algorithmic identity that is both representative of and in turn shapes the social categories within which we experience the world. As this type of identity formation, quote, uses statistical commonality models to determine one's gender, class, or race in an automatic manner, at the same time as it defines the actual meaning of gender, class, or race themselves. The consequences of this, according to Cheney Lippold, are connected to what he called to what he calls, quote, soft biopower and soft biopolitics that exert forms of control in continuous feedback loops, a process that Cheney Lippold, after Deleuze, calls modulation. Algorithmic identities are thereby constantly formed in interaction with technical infrastructures, for example, search engines, right? We enter words into the search engine and the search engine then also uses this data to um, to modify itself right modify its own algorithms and thus um, algorithmic identities become major sites but very implicit and invisible sites of control frank pascali in this context regards the algorithmic self as deeply subject to personalized information, which can lead to tailor cut advertising and information, but which can have potentially isolating effects on the individual. We also know how personalization can lead to the polarization of societies through the production of so-called echo chambers and so on. We can really see that um, in so many uh, ways uh, today. Another context involved in the formation of the algorithmic self is constituted by the demands of the user's <clears throat> simultaneous presence in different spatialities. This is at once due to the fact that, as Zizi Pepper-Carisi has argued, the so-called network self has to perform in converging network platforms in which different social spheres interlap. And I think every academic on Twitter knows how challenging this simultaneous curating of public and private persona is, right? As Lauren Scott has observed, the algorithmic self is a four-dimensional human, a self whose main form of existence is that of co-presence. And I quote, Today, we live with the sense that untweeted, un Instagram moments might feel somehow cubic, as in boxed in. Just these four walls, unless the walls can be contorted along invisible lines and a message smuggled out. Another major challenge of this urge of constant communication is that of maintaining self-control in a carefully designed and algorithmically driven attention economy. 
the algorithmic self displays a new sense of hyperattention. And there has been quite a lot of debate about how and if digital media is changing our reading patterns. I don't want to go into this debate, um, but what is for sure, algorithms are now largely um, constructed to manipulate our attention to maximize monetization. In the information age, attention has become a resource to be extracted. So the invisible infrastructures of our digital presence are instrumental in shaping our very interactions with and experiences of the world more than we're usually aware of. Accounts of the digital or the algorithmic self, to be more specific, hover between this ambivalence of at least imagined sociability on the one hand and a substantial loss of agency on the other. The algorithmic self, it seems, is constantly enmeshed in the relational media infrastructures and in other selves. And this relational embeddedness coupled with an attention-seeking existentialism is perhaps why the algorithmic self is particularly vulnerable and constantly under pressure to form itself or to be formed. So if algorithms are new agents in the formation of the self, where does that leave narrative? narratives as the, let's say, the traditional um, form of, of uh, creating selfhood or constituting selfhood. It seems that narratives and algorithms are two rather different modes of self-formation. Algorithms are designed to be as universal, determined, and reproducible as possible. They create order by reducing complexity and eliminating ambiguity in order to create a maximum chance for automation. Narratives, on the other hand, it seems are privileged spaces of polysemy and ambiguity, and thus different and unique every single time. They create complexities about subjective experience and explore conceptual and aesthetic border zones of meaning making as well as for critical reflection. Lev Manovich has called database and narrative natural enemies very famously, and perhaps the same also holds true for, uh, for algorithms and narratives, or is such a binary opposition too simplistic and reductive, and perhaps too much embedded in a nostalgic desire to return to a pre-digital formation of the self. One that, of course, also has its very problematic politics, right? If we uh, think about how narratives afford their own sets of hierarchies, questions of accessibility, gatekeeping, normative production, reception conventions, etc. So are algorithms and narratives really such opposite forms of meaning making or in this specific case of self formation? Literature itself is a medium that is, um, we could argue, um, partially automatic through complex interactions of human, non-human, discursive, and material processes, um, right? So sometimes we have the feeling that literature also writes itself, that fiction somehow is an automated script, right? And Roman ja Jacobson's concept of literariness also suggests a certain set of formal properties that distinguish literary texts from non-literary texts. So they're also rule-based. Um, a certain level of formalization seems to be an aesthetic marker, not only of algorithms, but also of literature. Narratives and algorithm, algorithms are also similar in their temporal sequentiality and their textuality. Both are usually based on a scripted code. Since narratives also work on the level of temporal unfolding, could they even be considered narrative agents or rather a form of narrative liminality? Taking into account the cultural function of algorithms as world building and world ordering, they may relate to narratives in more complex, perhaps even symbiotic ways than commonly discussed to use Catherine Hale's um, critique of Lev Manovich's enemy model. In fact, it might be exactly the form of collaboration between human and machine form, or 
let's say, between narrative and algorithmic forms of self-formation that best captures the digital self. We know that recounting without counting doesn't work, or perhaps it is exactly the desire of sociability paired with the fragmentation algorithms afford that makes the algorithmic self so invested in self-narration and self-legibility. And it is exactly this ambivalence of algorithmic self-formation see, that these two novels negotiate. It is a tension between the reflexive understanding of self-formation as in I form myself and the non-reflexive rendering of this process as in I am being formed. The novels frame this struggle within the posthumanist discourse of agency and control in both imitating algorithmic self-formation and in fashioning themselves decidedly as a counter model to algorithmic knowledge, they deliberately disrupt the logic of automation inherent in the formation of the self. Rather, I would say, they make the blind spots and the effective reception structures of algorithmic knowledge visible. By doing so, they very much complicate notions of recognition and attention in processes of algorithmic self-formation. And ultimately, I would say they offer meta-fictional reflections on the media and um, the cultural conditions of narrative in an algorithmic world. Now, let's start with the first novel. Natasha Stagg's novel, Surveys, tells the story of the 23-year-old protagonist, Colleen, who initially works in an American shopping mall as a customer surveyor and increasingly achieves fame as a blogger and social media celebrity. Here, the title survey is very interesting, alludes to both her job as a customer surveyor um, and uh, the capitalist necessity of market research, while at the same time it stands metonymically for a quantitative rating culture in which not only goods but also humans, individuals, are uh, constantly under observation in terms of their market value. Colleen thus paradigmatically represents what Cheney Lippold has described as the shift in marketing from demographic census data-based identification of consumers to psychographic big data aggregated identification. To locate the algorithmic self within the marketing logic of consumption provides an economic framework that the novel explores through shifting modes of self-commodification in the 21st century. And here's a quote. The protagonist uh, describes um, her daily life, right? Her routine. You work and you get paid. You wake up and someone puts a price on you. You grow old and your price diminishes. If you're not getting paid, you're losing money. This laconic and procedural statement, almost like an algorithm, I think, is radically pragmatic. In the monotonous repetition of the second person, you, paired with command like verbs, like, you know, you do this, it somehow exerts a habitual and rule based universality. The descriptive and abstract vocabulary, the simple syntax with paratactical and conditional arrangement makes these sentences resemble the unambiguous nature of code. It's very matter of fact, right? In its mechanical form, it cynically performs how human identity is boiled down to its corporeal net value. Based on this conclusion, Colleen's decision to leave market research behind and to become a social media celebrity, actually a very successful one, makes perfect sense in view of her self-marketization. Yet instead of reading this as a disruptive break with the logic of consumer capitalism, the novel exposes the radical economization of the protagonist as a continuation of the algorithmically automated scripting of the self. We could say that on a formal level, the novel mimics the procedures of an automated 
datafication of the self. A sequence of many brief chapters titled with, sorry, here's the, um, yeah, the things that are titled. Okay, so a sequence of many brief chapters um, titled with first names of Colleen's co-workers, neighbors, friends, etc., reflects the rapid accumulation of data profiles in the world of customer surveyors. The chapters and consequently individual names appear in quick succession without narrative links or character development. They're literally stacked on top of each other like survey sheets. The network self and the reader as well struggle to process and manage offline and online social relations in the hyper-converging of social contexts as the very fast-paced sequence of shifting snippets writes itself almost automatically, right? This is what I talked about earlier. In the attention economy of constant scrolling and encountering new people, or the same people, always <laughs> new again, it is easy to miss one of the central events in the plot. So Colleen meets Jim, her private and also social media partner. Colleen quickly leaves her job and starts a new life as a social media celebrity. The description of their online encounter blatantly rejects any of the literary conventions of romance. No central impressions, but rather a matter of fact summary. And I quote, I met him online. It doesn't matter how, and we began to merge our following. Describing it would be pointless, and anyway, you can look it up. It was interaction and people love to see that. I used a fake name so I could freely write without the burden of imagining my friends reading. Eventually though, my friends knew about it because everyone knew about it. Together, we became more famous than Jim had been alone in a matter of months. We were on buzz sites as lists and then models played us in magazines as editorials. And then we were on buzz sites as items but there are no photos of us together, just screen grabs of our life face-to-face -face chats. Here, the conspicuous absence of an affective dimension of falling in love demonstrates that this relationship is more an economic necessity rather than romance. Um, the self, or rather two merged selves, become mere data points in a complex web of monetary relations they are items reassembled into lists, editorials, and screen grabs. Their modular textuality, as what Cheney Lippold would call dividuals after Deleuze, automatically molds them into sheer numbers. Even the act of reconstructing the encounter into narrative fails as the narrator, sorry, I forgot this, yeah. the narrator, um, say, um, quote, forgot the conversations we had while they were happening and remembered only the screen, the numbers, the results, our exchanges. Life writing has become completely automated recording. And in fact, the protagonist feels increasingly trapped in this world by her jealousy of Jim's affair, her monetary dependence on her fame, literally by her inability to create meaning out of the fast paced rhythms of online communication. Sometimes the words would move by so quickly I couldn't read them, even though it was me who was scrolling. My computer was having a lot of problems then. Sometimes my browser crashed and a cartoon of a sad file popped up, and other times everything faded to white. There is nothing I could do. As Colleen's reading turns into a mechanical scrolling, it is not only, only her computer her breaks, but also herself who was left feeling completely desolate and without agency. The computer has become a technology, not only not of self-making, but of self-unmaking. What is more, Colleen understands that in a public online ecology, surveys quickly turn into surveillance, making it seem impossible for her to escape the panoptic gaze of her followers. I can't just go away. No one can just go away anymore. I can't even go away from people I feel lukewarm about. They can look me up. 
When the novel closes with Colleen's return to her hometown and the reunion with her family and her best high school friend, Amanda, she does have a moment of escape, it seems anyway. I would say though that the novel resists a nostalgic closure of homecoming. Right? There is no happy ending. <laughs> Colleen cannot resist the hyperconnectivity and speed of her online identity. And again, I quote, online, there is no stopping. We can go forever there. I had missed the slowness because online, I was the thing being stretched in every direction at once. And here it was my surroundings as I drove. I looked straight ahead through the windshield with new sparkling confidence that I could continue a life in public. It was like I joined a religion I couldn't reject. And my dependence on earthly desire was what fixed me down here to the world. I felt better knowing this about myself. How much the reader wishes for Colleen to withdraw from her online persona, to delete her social media account and to return to a happy ending without the constant machinery of algorithmic self-creation only shows how much we, as readers, still cling to the liberal, autonomous, and authentic self. The novel, however, rejects such a reading of stable selfhood. In instigating the reader's frustration, the novel itself disrupts the progressive narrative of disruptive innovation, right? There is nothing glamorous nor innovative about algorithmic self-creation, just an endless and highly superficial repetition of staged collective events and a lot of gossip. In exposing the emptiness, banality, and unidentifiability with this social media celebrity, the novel holds a mirror in front of us that spells out the structures and economic prehistory of our hyper-relational social media existence. It urges us to recognize ourselves in Colleen and it instrumentalizes the, the disturbing effect of this display to turn the collective gaze against ourselves while only allowing momentary glimpses of meaningful self-reflection that always very, very quickly turn into self-promotion. At the same time, the novel by self-reflexively emphasizing on the publisher's website <laughs> that it is a novel is also a survey in a different way. A critical comment that detaches itself from the immersion of online authorship, clearly marking its fictional status and thus refusing to become entangled with the marketability of online authorship. Now, this is a form of self-fashioning that is underscored by the choice of publishing the book with semiotext, um, which is one of America's leading independent presses as part of MIT Press. Now let's turn to the second novel, Patricia Lockwood's novel, No One Is Talking About This, which already seems like a contradiction in terms because everyone is talking about this novel at the moment. It was a finalist for last year's Booker Prize and was one of the New York Times 10 best books of the year 2021. In fact, to call this a novel is already quite um, problematic because the text is a mix between novel, memoir, poetry, and aphorisms that almost read like tweets. Like in surveys, the hybrid form makes us recognize the logic of social media while at the same time also misrecognizing it, right? So it also somehow modifies it. The, the aphorisms are not really tweets. They are transformed into a mixture of prose and poetry with a narrative voice um, that struggles to create meaning as narrative coherence between the fragmented impressions is being sought. Similar to surveys, no one is talking about this, features a young female protagonist who co has come to fame on and is addicted to the constant and instant gratification of social media and 
really why all these social media addicts have to be young women in fiction, I don't know. It would be an interesting um, <laughs> research project. Just like Colleen, the unnamed protagonist here is tempted by the attention grabbing posts uh, that she consumes while feeling the emptiness, the voids um, that the amassing images leave inside her. And I quote, the amount of eavesdropping that was going on was enormous and the implications not yet known. Other people's diaries streamed around her. She lay every morning under an avalanche of details, blissed pictures of breakfasts in Patagonia, a girl applying her foundation with a hard boiled egg, a Shiba Inu in Japan leaping from paw to paw to greet its owner, ghostly pale women posting pictures of their bruises, the world pressing closer and closer, the spider web of human connection grown so thick, it was almost a shimmering and solid silk and the day still not opening to her. What did it mean that she was allowed to see this? The paratactical syntax in this passage reproduces the horizontal arrangement of disconnected visual and textual information that social media continuously spits out. The global scope of this disjointed array of experiences evokes a transcultural um, idea or, or a notion of human connectedness. You can see here the, the dominant network metaphors, um, the small world and the spider web, but they no longer carry the liberating cyber utopian associations of creative multiplicity. Rather, the networks here are perceived as suffocating. Like Colleen, the protagonist is experiencing a loss of individual agency in the webs that surround her, despite the infinite streams of images and words into her consciousness, the day is still not opening to her. She notices a disconnect between the quantity of data available and the quality of the experience of taking it all in. If, however, she's much more able than the protagonist in surveys to reflect on the purpose of the normalized surveillance of what she here calls digital eavesdropping. This increased sense of distance to what is called her airy, sorry, her airy prominence elsewhere is supported by the heterodiegetic narration with internal focalization, um, which, is, which um, is prominently expressed in free indirect discourse and indirect thought. So basically, it, this is not a first person narrator, right? Um, it's a third person narrator. So there is a sense of distance, but however, we experience the world through her eyes. And this makes it somehow seem universal in a way as it is, or it could be our own perspective. Both the semantic reconfiguration of the network, as well as the level of critical self-reflection can be considered disruptive elements into the naturalization of algorithmic sociality that the novel partakes in itself by focalizing the protagonist's fragmented online experience. Into the second part of the book, rather suddenly, the reader is confronted with a turn of events and sudden change of tone. While at first the protagonist feels secure in the realm of social media, her world is suddenly shattered when she learns that her sister is pregnant with a severely disabled child. Immediately, quote, she went silent in the portal. She, know, she knew how it was. She knew that as you scrolled, you averted your eyes from the ones who could not apply their lipstick within the lines, from the ones who were beginning to edge up into mania. But above all, you averted your eyes from the ones who were in mad grief, whose mouths were open like caves with ancient paintings inside. And then, if all she was was funny and none of this was funny, where did that leave her? The appearance of the yet unborn disabled child shatters the false security of an ableist assumption of a body optimization culture which is perpetuated by the performative possibilities and algorithmic biases of social media. By doing so, it also deeply disturbs the protagonist's own identity, 
because her identity has been built on the affective relations of physical and intellectual attraction that social media fame afford. She knows that the logic of internet fame follows the simple rules of affirmative likes for optimized or for cute content on the one hand, and of course also on the other hand, politically polarized opinions on the other. So where does this polarization leave a highly ambiguous and ethically highly complex dilemma of how to proceed with a pregnancy that will not produce a baby in line with normative ideals of marketability um, and ultimately with capitalist productivity? If her sudden withdrawal from social media is due to the medium's problem with ambiguity, it is also about the very existential question of what defines a human in an age of post-human entanglements. When the baby is born alive against all odds, the protagonist is enthusiastic. Quote, it was a marvel how cleanly and completely this lifted her out of the stream of regular life. She was a gleaming sterilized instrument flashing out at the precise moment of emergency. She wanted to stop people on the street and say, do you know about this? You should know about this. No one is talking about this. And this is of course where the title of the book comes from. The baby's birth exposes the holes in the web of online communication, the blind spots of an illusion of total connectivity. The encounter with this newborn reveals that although on the web everyone seems to be constantly talking about everything, social media may perhaps not be the participatory and inclusive space it claims to be. And we all only have to think of, for example, TikToks, um, practice of shadow banning users with disability, uh, allegedly to um, protect them from being bullied. Um, and this, we could say, displays only the tip of the iceberg of a pervasive practice um, in social media to silence non-normative selves. The algorithmic and cultural habits of social media communication are still hard to reconcile with the fast paced demands of self performance embedded in a capitalist attention economy. And yet for our protagonist, this allegedly imperfect child puts her own attention in sharp focus. She describes this encounter as a form of awakening, awakening with with heightened sensibilities, a moment of pure recognition that crystallizes from the fogginess of random noise. The imagery of precision, of sterile non-messiness, renders this act of recognition almost machine-like, we could say. And yet, this is a spiritual, almost sublime encounter that reveals the exclusionary mechanisms of social media and its underlying normative conception of the human body. When the baby's health then throughout the novel deteriorates and the nurse says everything's wrong with her, um, the narrator thinks, no, with us, she wanted to shout, everything wrong with us. And this expresses a critical disability studies attempt at denaturalizing disability and referring to its social constructiveness. This act of recognition, half human, half machine, turns into an escape from the disciplinary regime of surveillance for the algorithmic self. Now, interestingly, the um, author of the novel, not the narrator, but the author, Patricia Lockwood, still feels the impulse to communicate this experience to others, right? Only that she no longer does it on social media, um, but no, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm ahead of myself now. So the, 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 uh, the author of the, the social media post, right? So we're talking about the narrator. So she's not no longer doing this on social media, but is tempted to do this in the public of the street. The impetus, however, is the same as the exclamatory style of this passage underlies. Even though this is a highly personal and intimate matter, 
the urge to catch the public's attention and to direct awareness to this taboo subject emerges as a struggle between different relatable events in the competitiveness of the attention economy. The title of the novel, No One Is Talking About This, may be an attempt to draw attention to the gaps of the network, um, uh, the network logic uh, or social network logic, but it implicitly also confirms the underlying logic of the datafied world. What is implied is the programmatic command that the novel takes up itself, namely that somebody should be talking about this, that this experience should enter the databases of lived experiences. A total escape from what Scott calls the four dimensional existence is hard to imagine and would perhaps even be in a way unpolitical, right? So ultimately the novel's ending leaves the possibility of what Urs Stähli has called de-networking, quite ambiguous. Um, so de-networking, like in surveys, doesn't really work very well, right? Although the baby dies in the end, and the narrator also is being robbed um, of her smartphone in the end, a specific religious martyr and salvation narrative is evoked. Right. So is the disruption of the social media self through contact with uh, real life, in fact, an act of liberation? I would say yes and no. And I quote, someone at some point slid her phone out of her pocket and she lifted off her feet. Lighter, her whole self was on it if anyone wanted. Someone would try to unlock it later. Right. The narrator says about the phone. So. The novel does not give into the illusion of de-networking um, as a complete uh, kind of withdrawal from social networks or from digital connections, um, especially, and now I'm turning to the author, not the narrator, but the author of the book, especially given Patricia Lockwood's own very active social media presence. She has more than 100,000 Twitter followers alone demonstrates that the book itself and its fame cannot be disentangled from the discourse it critically engages with. However, the book, no one is talking about this, succeeds in challenging the algorithmic structures of self-performance by offering a radically different narrative of beauty in imperfection. While the disruptive effect of surveys um, relies on the, the effect of recognizing ourselves in the dystopian narrative of complete entrapment, no one is talking about this, suggests that while we may not be able to escape our algorithmic condition in the age of social media, we can imagine alternatives to the dehumanizing processes of algorithmic automation. And perhaps, <laughs> this is interesting, perhaps these alternatives um, may even be found exactly in the logic of social media itself. So let me conclude. Both novels, sorry, both novels in different ways narrativize and thus contextualize as well as denaturalize the habitual processes of digital self narration. They offer critical interventions into the normalizing patterns of algorithmic self-making, both by revealing the hidden costs of the glossy online celebrities, as well as by opening literary spaces of reflection within these disembodied forms of networked communication. By um, mirroring and replicating the aesthetics of the attention economy, both novels undermine and challenge the platform capitalist principles of self monetization through algorithmic data profiling. And I'd like to end with a quote by uh, critic Mervy Emery, uh, who in her New York Times book review of No One Is Talking About This proposes that quote, for Lockwood, the question of how it feels for one person to be online is indistinguishable um, from how the internet would narrate its own virtual 
existence. Right, yeah, it's in the middle of this quote. So the critical self-positioning of both novels may lie exactly in the post-human merging of narrative and algorithms, of human and machine, and of surface and depth. Instead of reverting to a nostalgic, uh, to a nostalgia uh, for a supposedly um, uh, bygone um, analog past, the novels show us how to negotiate and how to destabilize algorithmic selfhood in order to reveal its fragility. For Rita Felsky, one of the functions of literature or what she calls the uses of literature is that we recognize ourselves in a book, that we feel addressed, summoned, called to account. And I would say that these two novels, while suggesting that algorithmic selfhood is inevitable, still they offer moments of recognition, both in the sense of automated pattern recognition, as well as in the sense of creating self-awareness. They remind us of the potentials of a symbiotic relationship between algorithmic and narrative formations of selfhood as very different, contrary, but at the same time, mutually dependent technologies of the self. Thank you very much. Yes, so thank you very much, um, Professor Dr. Regina Schober. And um, with this, I would also say we directly start to the discussion round, or with the discussion round. And yes, I think it was really interesting, and it was also a really interesting approach to um, see the concepts of algorithm, to see the concepts of algorithmic cells in um, terms of the um, cultural concepts which are connected to them. And also then in terms of the two books you um, presented us today. And so from my side and also from the side how I un understood the books, um, I would also say that they both have very different curses of events and also approaches in terms on how the um, protagonists develop their thoughts and also in terms of um, how they develop their own algorithmic service, but also in how maybe also other people in their environments develop their own algorithmic service. Because I could also imagine that for the um, last book um, that for example, um, there are also maybe included the views of um, the um, person who is giving birth to the child, for example, and that these are also a little bit different, maybe depicted. Um, based on perhaps, this, yeah. perhaps uh, just to to um, connect to this, it's a really interesting observation. But the novel do doesn't do that, and that's interesting, right? So the novel doesn't give a voice to the sister. Um, the novel really um, stays with the uh, focalization of the narrator. And I think um, the effect of this, right? I mean, we, we could really have imagined also to, you know, have a perspective of the sister and to um, perhaps discuss questions and dilemmas of motherhood and so on. But the novel doesn't do that. And I think it's interesting that through this very strict um, character focalization only through the unnamed protagonist, um, this, this, um, uh, this pregnancy or this, this uh, disability becomes on the one hand removed, right, in a way and, and distant um, and inaccessible in a way, but also in a, uh, in a sense very much um, a, um, let's say, uh, a way for the protagonist to think through her own relationship with the world. It's not really about the baby, we could argue. I mean, we could also criticize that about the novel, right? And the novel has been criticized um, to kind of use the baby, the, the disabled child, as a, a kind of a prompt for self-reflection and self-renewal and self um 
reinvention and all that. So definitely that that could be problematic. But I think the focus very much here is on the social media user um, and uh, their um, uh, kind of ways of being embedded in the world. But this this comment is really interesting. Thank you. <laughs> yes, yeah, sure. Because I was I'm also surprised that you um, because I would not expect this, but um, on the other hand, um, as you also say, then the focus lays on the user itself. Um, it's also interesting to know this and also maybe it also might go in line with the aspect that this is also some kind of direction and order which is given like, for example, you also have that you when you are on social media also don't have um, all voices at the same time, for example, in the same proportion. Mm -hmm. um, also, maybe um, in terms of this, um, my question is, um, and how far or is there also, and how far is there the information given, and how far there is um, the experience or also real experience given um, from the authors, from maybe their own life, or also um, from people in their environment, um, which is included in the book. Is there any information about yeah, that? That's also a really interesting question. Thank you so much. Um, because I think, um, I mean, I didn't really talk about the author and her own biography, but there are very strong autobiographical elements in this um, in this novel, in the second one. The first one, we don't really know much about the author, but the second one, um, the, the novel has sometimes been discussed in, in the larger context of autofiction, right? So the kind of semi-autobiographical, mode of memoir, self-reflection, um, that has, of course, also as a genre, very much grown in the age of social media and in the age of, of blogging or in the age of, let's say, the, you know, what has been called the Web 2.0. Um, um, so it's also interesting how this mode of introspection and this mode of um, self-reflection um, that is so dominant in, in, in the web 2.0 <laughs> has also very much modified um, literary, uh, the literary field and has very much entered literary genres. Um, I mean, there was autofiction before social media, definitely, right? But there has been a huge surge. And this, this, um, this novel, Patricia Lockwood's novel, definitely has autobiographical elements. Um, of course, we have to always be careful, right, to um, look too much at the the author's biography and to draw any kind of conclusions for our interpretation. But in this case, I think um, it's interesting to think about this because the author deliberately plays with this idea of authorship, right? Who is this who is the real author? <laughs> Can we even say that? And again, also the idea of who is the real narrator who is the um who's that person on social media is that are we able to get closer to the real um social media user or are we always just looking at a facade at a kind of media um uh, kind of construction and so auto fiction in this case i think is very a very interesting genre to think about um, the conception of the self and also of the creative self and the, the self as author and so on. Yeah, so thank you. Hey, thank you. It's also interesting to hear your um, yeah, also comment on this and also um, that um, especially then for the uh, second book, there is uh, some kind of fiction, but also some kind of real life experience included. Um, with this, I would also um, look to both of you, Eileen and Stefan, and who want maybe proceed with a further question. I may, uh, because because we're currently talking about the second book, and uh, I'd like to ask a rather con concrete question about the second book, because um, coming from, from the perspective of, of, of media studies, I was a bit surprised by the, the cover image of the second book. Because what you described was was the denaturalization of of of, of this this concept of self, but what I saw there was something supernatural, like this portal like structure, M. C. Escher esque, and uh, somehow heavenly. And um, I don't know, think, thinking about Jeanette, about Suri, about about the 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 threshold uh, through which we enter 
the the book and and this cover kind of gave me i don't know ideas of a of a fantasy novel maybe so there is this element of of denaturalization but not the kind i expected of this novel so there is not a there is an interface somehow the portal is an interface and being of course a cover of a, of a book it's also somehow our interface to the book but um it's not not a display or something not 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 a mobile phone so uh how how does this cover image go together with the book do you have any ideas on that could you elaborate on that oh that's such a great observation thank you so much i mean what we see here is definitely the portal right the um the entrance point um into this portal it's also interesting that she doesn't really specify the platform she just uh, uses the abstract uh, concept of the portal uh, so she doesn't talk about Instagram or Twitter, although, you know, we could, um, she probably <laughs> still wants the book to be um, <laughs> valid in 10 years when there is a different set of social media platforms, but it's, it's interesting. So everything here, I think, is about this kind of um, allure of the universal, right? The universal um, idea of uh, connectivity and of social media platform. And I think the cover, I haven't really thought about this, I have to admit. So I, my answer wouldn't be very elaborate. I will think about it though. Um, but um, definitely there is this element of the spiritual, sublime, right? The individual, not only is the individual very small in this large world, but here the individual isn't even there anymore, right? So there is no um not even a romantic tiny subject in front of a huge landscape but the individual isn't there anymore and instead everything is kind of dissolved into this universal sphere of you know spiritual um transcendence we could say and this is this is interesting on so many levels because uh, also as i said um ed finn has called algorithms uh, this kind of transcendental, transcendental spiritual black box. Um, so, I mean, you know, we could ask our algorithms, our new religion or our new God, perhaps, right? The kind of authority that we don't see and we, we can't grasp, uh, but still they have a lot of control over us. Um, so I, I would probably read the, um, the cover in that context. Um, and then there is the rainbow. <laughs> Right. I mean, the I don't know, I, I I would have to reread the novel to see if the rainbow has any direct significance, because usually right as a symbol for, you know, LGBTQ plus uh, communities or, or, you know, queerness, whatever. I don't think that this is really the context here, but I might be overlooking something as well. I think it's more like a reference to to transcendence and um, perhaps the the fragmentation of the self to the point that there is um, kind of total um, total connectivity again. Also, I mean, I, sorry, I'm, I'm rambling a little bit, but the, um, the, the concept of um, emergence, like as in complexity theory, um, as in the, the things that emerge from um, complex patterns, that are more than the sum of their parts could also be something here, right? So there's all this data, there's all this information, information overload and big data, um, and also things that don't really go together and there's a sense of being overwhelmed. And then something new can emerge from this, right? Something unexpected. And I mean, the novel really plays with these unexpected events where, with, with breaks of the illusion and, um, I don't know um, who ever has read the novel yet is um, uh, it's an interesting reading experience because you're constantly kind of being uh, disturbed in your expectations. When you think you've understood the novel, then suddenly something else happens. And so it could also be about these unexpected encounters and um, uh, things that emerge like the rainbow. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you so much because that was a lot of insight uh, in, into the novel and how that might might play a role. So uh, thank you so very much.
Okay, so then I think it's my turn. So uh, with that, I also would like to go a little bit away from the two novels and I would like to go more also to the concept of the algorithmic self. So uh, first of all, of course, thank you so much for your presentation and also the insights uh, to the novels. And I agree with both of my colleagues. It was really interesting and all the insights and also what it means or what the narrator is telling us or also what the aim of the author was. So my question also is now um, your experience. Uh, if you have a look, for example, to both to your working environment, but also to your environment with friends and family, how they or if they are aware about this concept of algorithmic self. I mean, because you talked to us about this novel and this was something like everyday life. So uh, something very normal again, as I said, and this would be very interesting to me to know your experience or what you experienced regarding this concept. So what can you maybe tell us about this or what did you experience? That would really interesting. Um absolutely thank you so much for the question it's such a an important question um also because of the idea of the black box right very often these structures are invisible and we don't we're not aware of them and we or at least we're told that they're a black box and we can't control them and so on um also this huge divide between let's say um those who have the technical expertise the people who can read code and who can also, you know, have the agency to write the code and the majority of people who can't and who um, are subject to these structures. And um, I mean, this has a lot to do with power and with um, accessibility. Um, but also, um, I mean, awareness, uh, I think the uh, the effects of the algorithmic self are quite visible to all of us, right? I mean, with, I don't know, consumer recommendation systems, search engine results, um, or also the, you know, the, the, the data uh, visualizations of my, my you know, smartwatch or Fitbit or whatever. Um, I mean, we, we are constantly um, uh, confronted with the results and the effects of even like, of course, my news feed and my social media, um, uh, uh, kind of the arrangement of social media feeds that I, I read, um, all this, but the, the, the sense of powerlessness and la loss of agency that is um, connected with that isn't even something that we are aware of. We may feel it physically, in terms of being exhausted or being um, addicted in the sense that we waste a lot of time scrolling on our smartphones. I mean, there is this great documentary, I'm sure you all know this, uh, The Social Dilemma, which really addresses these, these issues of, um, say, social media addiction. Um, and of course, the uh, creators of the attention econ or of of algorithms within the attention economy are very, very smart and very hardworking to obscure these these um, uh, these structures. So I think we're probably pretty powerless. However, I don't want to paint a too bleak picture. Um, I would say that exactly novels like these can highlight the effects of such um, uh, such uh, effects of the algorithmic self not in the way that they really explain how the algorithms work that, that they can't do that right um but rather to the effect that while we read the novel we identify with the characters to a certain extent perhaps we we blatantly misidentify with the characters that could also be we especially with the first novel we are constantly frustrated with this protagonist and we think how can she uh, fall into that trap again which also perhaps reminds us that we should be more careful. So they they could be read as as tales of warning. They could also be read as um, experiential um, simulations, uh, where at the end we are left feeling like scrolling through our our Twitter feed, um, only that we've read a novel. And I think um, at that point, at that point where 
we start feeling something, right? It's not about understanding necessarily. It's it's really the affective level of feeling, of experiencing the the mode of of um, information overload and so on. At this point, novels have a really um, productive opportunity and entry point for making us reflect the effects of this. And of course, as a literary scholar, I have to say that, but I would really say that literature, art and um, film can draw our attention to these effects. And so, um, yes, we should all read more novels. We should all watch more <laughs> films about this, definitely. Um, uh, because uh, social media is just taking so much of our time and um, perhaps we, we also may want to think about how are we kind of distributing our attention, which is limited uh, to, to different media forms. So it's also a statement on, on media itself. I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind, of, um, uh, kind of a bit off your question now, but the question of where do we see this? Well, usually we don't, but uh, we can try and see it a little bit more. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much. And I think it was exactly also the question I was uh, looking for or the answer I was looking for, because as you said, so, or I would also agree, maybe it is not only, or there's not only the importance to explain very scientifically how those algorithmic are working, because I mean, that's exactly the point, right? So we need also another medium or another language to let people feel or to let citizens feel what is happening and also to offer them a possibility to feel that or to think about it that this could be them. And I think this makes it also more approachable also to understand what the algorithmic self is. So overall, I think the answer was exactly the answer I was looking for. So that's a good way mm -hmm. also uh, to try to explain what algorithmic self is in a way like Please experience it, experience by yourself and see yourself maybe also in the characters in this novel. And this also gives me a chance, for example, to remember this also a topic like uh, algorithmic literacy. And there's also the discussion about it. And I know that my colleague Isabel Dosh also knows this topic um, that how to explain, for example, also a concept like this if the people don't know what the concept means. And I think it's a little bit similar with the algorithmic self. So how, how is, how, to what extent is it efficient to try it with the scientific explanation of, again, algorithmic self, if maybe people don't know what it means. And I think in this point, it is really good to have novels who show it with examples, with everyday life example, and then to give people the chance to realize that is the meaning of it. And I'm part of it. And I have also some parts of this in my life so mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much for this insight and also for your point of view regarding my question perhaps there's and i find this really interesting perhaps i can respond to this quickly um um i mean there is a big debate in literary studies uh, whether humans um are you know i mean there 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 has a lot been a long uh long-standing um idea that humans are storytelling animals right that we are animals <laughs> but we have the the the, the extra uh, ability and capacity to tell stories and this is what makes us humans and um i mean i i would partially also agree with this right i would also say that um since the beginning of humanity we have been telling each other stories and we have been we have tried to make sense of the world uh, through storytelling, not necessarily with the, the traditional kind of novel, right? The novel only emerged in the 18th century, but um, through just telling stories orally and, uh, you know, telling your neighbor what happened yesterday and to kind of put uh, very complex matters into a sequence of events that have causal relations and that follow a certain temporal structure and so on, which seems to be the way that we make sense of the world very, very often. I'm actually doing it right now, right? If you uh, think about the way that we um, communicate, we often do this in, in narrative terms. Um, and it's interesting now to look at uh, data and information structures and algorithms, because in a way, I mean, data bases are not stories. They are um, kind of structured uh, collections uh, of, of, of information or of, of facts, right? Um, but um, 
Now we can take that data and turn them into stories. Algorithms are already ways of turning, let's say, data into sequences of perhaps rules or um, procedures. So they're kind of already um, verging into the into the direction of storytelling. But still, they're not really stories yet because. Right there, stories are usually ambiguous. They leave open a lot of space for reflection, for interpretation. Um, so, and algorithms are not really that. So I would, rather than seeing them as complete opposites, data, algorithms, and stories, I would say they're kind of, um, they're different modes of forming knowledge on a spectrum, um, right? From, let's say, um, yeah, on, on a spectrum, let's, let's not go uh, deeper into this. And whenever you look at data structures, when you ever, whenever you look at databases, um, you always have a certain implied narrative in those data structures, either explicitly written, like, uh, you know, an explanation of the database or of the data visualization, or implicit in the categories that are used in the kind of cultural historical um, framing of, of the data. Um, so um, I think as humans, we need stories. <laughs> we need stories to make sense of the, the abstract um, data and also the algorithmic structures, the rules that are, that, that are um, pervasive. Um, so perhaps that's another footnote to your to your question. Thank you so much. I, don't, I also want to hear if there's anything in the chat. <laughs> so, yeah. So far, there are no questions okay. in the chat, but uh, let me just just uh, uh, maybe chime in with a with a quick remark. What you just said about about the necessity of, of narrating in in this in this context, I, I think it's at least at least twofold, as you just pointed out, as in. Um, when we produce even even in digital humanities this is something we are quite aware of because we are humanists but we're doing something with digital stuff so there's kind of this this uh closeness to to, to narration and a lot of a lot of people are also literary scholars but um if we do something with data and if we visualize the data the visualization has to be put in some kind of narrative form as you just pointed out this is kind of the one one way uh narrative is necessitated here but uh, so, so to to put two and two together, maybe maybe it's like this: just how strong of a statement it might be to say, okay, the cultural implications of of algorithms are just as well. Uh, it's it's just as well necessary to put them into narrative form. So, uh, this is just just kind of a, a twofold relation, and, and 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 it's just well, it it just underscores of, of how how important this this kind of narration is in this context, and uh, how maybe it could. Uh, it could be of benefit to 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 digital education mm. and also i mean yes the the two-sidedness i think this is really important also to stress that algorithms are also culturally embedded right algorithms are also um uh, de very much dependent on cultural historical um context on assumptions values um uh, there are forms of situated knowledge, as Donna Haraway would say, right? They're not neutral. They're not um, kind of <laughs> um, set in stone or like natural laws, but of course they are made by humans embedded in uh, social cultural structures and um, which, which may also um, open up interesting possibilities for narrative um, or yeah, for literary scholars, scholars, uh, experts who are uh, experts in narratology, perhaps, to look at algorithms as forms of uh, narrative agents. And um, uh, so one of my PhD students, Marie van Lobenstein, is actually doing that in her project, where she looks at uh, TikTok algorithms as forms of uh, narrative agents. And I think this is a really uh, interesting and very productive way of, again, denaturalizing, demystifying algorithms and uh, really highlighting that um, that uh, uh, algorithms are not some spiritual 
or non-human um, other that we cannot control. They're not monsters, they're not kind of robots, but they're actually man-made and they're cultural um, forms of knowledge. And so again, in terms of digital education, but what does that, I mean, what, what prior knowledge does that presume? And that's another question, or let's say a challenge to us working in the digital humanities, um, that you need to be an expert in both fields, right? You need to be able to understand algorithms and you need to really be an expert in narratology. And um, there aren't many people who can do that. Um, and I think that's also our task as teachers in the digital humanities to, to develop those competencies and to really um, uh, to teach our students that to um, understand algorithms means not only to understand their technological constructedness, but also their cultural implications and vice versa. Right? Yeah. So thank you for that. Yes, so um, unfortunately, I was not able to hear everything about um, what you said, but um, I noted also maybe a small follow up on the aspects I understood because there were some internet um, connection errors here with me and also based on the aspect to be aware of algorithms. Um, as you also uh, already said that the novels are raising attention for the algorithms also on some um, specific way that one is reading it and can make reflect on it. I would also say that I'm um, also based on similar discussions I had with my students that um, also the literature on algorithm and algorithm literacy often reports on that we only notice algorithms in our daily lives when they are not working like we accept how they are working. And um, in terms of this, um, such kind of novels are a really good um, addition on um, or for the reflection and also for being aware also on the cultural effects, I would say. Mm. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, the, 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 um, this perspective, right, uh, is, I think, a central um, insight uh, developed by critical infrastructure studies to say that you only notice an infrastructure when it's not working. <laughs> which we can all relate to after you know two years of a pandemic um and so also with algorithms i mean this this would be one we could say um a diagnostic potential of disruption right if an algorithm no longer uh produces the results or is somehow disruptive that we start noticing it um and i would add i mean there, there are there are others, we talked a little bit about the, the physical relationship, the embodied relationship to algorithms. So um, uh, here, I think the reference of the second novel to disability is interesting because it also opens up space for the, let's say, um, uh, uh, mental illness uh, and um, uh, other forms of disability that may be an effect of, um, Kind of algorithmic overload we could say so again the 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 question of addiction um comes into play here although i do i i do have to wonder why it is as i said why these novels a lot of these novels actually feature young women as the victims of social media abuse which i don't think has anything to do with reality i think this is a, a cliche that goes back very, very um, long to the history of alleged media uh, overstimulation, media abuse. I mean, we have the discourse of, of um, the danger of reading, especially with younger women in the 19th century, uh, where parents were concerned that their daughters were reading too much and that they would be kind of totally lost in the real world and all that, right? Um, and I, I fear that this discourse is kind of reproducing itself right now, the fear of the young woman who's, who's kind of falling victim to social media. Um, so again, that's very interesting to, <laughs> to look at from a cultural studies perspective. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. And also thank you that you also um, again point out the aspects um, in terms of the protagonists that they are both women because 
I was also thinking when you first mentioned it, yes, I was also thinking, okay, it's interesting. And um, also that you now also um, underline this with um, more aspects. And um, I, I um, yeah, from this point, it's so interesting to discuss with you and also um, with all of us of the other um, side. We are already at the end of the time, unfortunately. So um, I really enjoyed um, your presentation and also our discussion today. And I would also uh, like to thank you very much for the presentation, also for our audience. Um, and this is maybe also the moment where I'm switching again back to German. And auch hier vielen Dank nochmal an Sie alle. Und ähm, dass Sie uns eben bei dem Vortrag vom Professor Dr. Regina Schober zugehört haben. Und ähm, ja, ansonsten würde ich jetzt eigentlich an dieser Stelle sehr, sehr gerne auf unser Abschlussevent, auf unsere Abschlussveranstaltung verweisen. Leider muss ich Ihnen aber sagen, dass die Abschlussveranstaltung vor Ort aus persönlichen als auch aus koordinatorischen Hintergründen am 15.07. leider nicht stattfinden kann. Aber Sie kennen ja das bekannte Sprichwort, aufgehoben ist nicht aufgeschoben und wir sind aktuell auch schon sehr stark in der Vorbereitung dabei, die Veranstaltung auf einen alternativen Termin zu verlegen und werden da dann auch ähm, recht zeitnah eben unser, auf unserer Webseite die Aktualisierungen vornehmen und auch in Social Media die Veranstaltung ankündigen. Also, dass Sie sich das auf jeden Fall schon mal vormerken können, dass das nicht ähm, ja, aufgehoben ist. Und ähm, dementsprechend, ähm, trotz alledem, auch ähm, nochmal allgemein der Dank, dass Sie uns bis jetzt auf dieser Reihe ähm, alle begleitet haben. Und für alle, die vielleicht den ein oder anderen Vortrag auch noch nicht gesehen haben, eben auch nochmal die Erinnerung dran, dass man ja zum Glück auch alles nochmal online sich anschauen kann. Allgemein nochmal der Dank an die KollegInnen an der Heinrich-Heine-Universität Düsseldorf, die auch im Hintergrund eben mitgeholfen haben und das Ganze eben ähm, mit begleitet haben. Und natürlich auch, auch nochmal an all unsere Vortragenden, die jetzt in den letzten Wochen eben hier mit uns gemeinsam ähm, da waren. Und ja, damit würde ich sagen verabschiede ich mich auch im Namen eben von uns allen, also auch von Dr. Aline Imeri und Stefan Reiner seelbach und natürlich auch von Ihnen, Frau Professor Dr. Regina Schuber. Und damit ähm, sind wir für heute soweit fertig.